Allah has favored the believers by sending to them a messenger from amongst them, reading and reciting his verses. He did not bring anything from his pocket. Allah says, he did not utter anything from his desires or lusts or fancies. Everything he said was revealed and inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, indeed, in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a perfect example for those who are looking forward to the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are looking forward to the last day. How many of us are looking forward to meeting with Allah? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah Rabbul Azza created the creation and from the entirety of creation He Azza wa Jal selected, honored, preferred and chose insan. And from amidst the children of Adam, Allah Rabbul Azza exalted, honored, preferred and chose the Anbiya. And in that regards, He Azza wa Jal sent 124,000 messengers and prophets to teach, lead and guide mankind. And from the galaxy of Anbiya, Allah Rabbul Izza chose the Rusul, the messengers whom were given a specific revelation or a new Sharia. Ah. And from amidst these chosen category of the Rusul, He Azza wa Jal selected five as the Ulil Azmi min al Rusul, as the greats amidst the messengers. These are the best sons of Adam the princes and the greatest and the grandest amidst the messengers. And then from the select group of five, he Azza wa Jal chose Khalilain Ithnain, two friends, Ibrahim wa Muhammada. And Allah Rabbul Izzah selected Ibrahim as a Khalil and Allah Rabbul Izzah chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a friend. And then he Azza wa Jal from these two friends elevated, honored, chosen, preferred our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the seal of prophethood. And he honored him with the maqam of Mahmud and Allah Rabbul Izza completed the age old religion of Islam through him. How can words of a mere individual ever be able to accurately convey the characteristics of Allah's best creation, the like of which humankind have never seen nor will ever see again, the awesomeness of this individual. The greatest human being to ever walk the face of this planet, the role model for the entire world, the most beloved to the heart of any believer, our prophet, our messenger, our example, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name means the praiseworthy one. His name means the exalted one. Muhammad, the meaning of the word Muhammad is the one who is praised the most and the one who is praised the highest in all of human history. And no human being has been loved and admired. And no human being will be more respected and venerated on Judgment Day than our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That on Judgment Day, when Allah combines the Awaleen and the Akhireen, when Allah combines the Muslims and the non-Muslims, when Allah combines all of humanity, and all of them are worried and scared, and they are expecting Judgment Day to begin, they will say, who amongst us will go and beg Allah to begin the Judgment Day so we can end all of this misery that we are in. So they will look and look and they will say, who better than our father Adam alayhi salam. So they will collectively go to Adam alayhi salam. And the hadith is very long. Adam will say, I'm not worthy of it. Go to somebody else, go to Nuh. Then Nuh will say the same to Ibrahim. Ibrahim will pass it to Musa. Musa will pass it to Isa. Isa will pass it to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so all of mankind, the first of them, the last of them, the men of them, the jinn of them, the ins of them, the Muslim of them, the kafir of them, all 
all of mankind without exception will unanimously appoint our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he will go and intercede and that will be the time when everybody will praise him and in this world it is only the believers who praise him and on judgment day everyone will praise him so indeed he is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam meaning the one who has been praised the utmost in fact Allah himself commands us to send salat upon our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he reminds us that he himself has done so and he has told us that the angels have done so in that famous verse in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid when all of the humanity appointed him as the representative on judgment day at that point in time he will be given the praiseworthy station which is called al maqam al mahmud and because it is the praiseworthy station who better than it be given to than the one who is muhammad and ahmad sallallahu alaihi wasallam both these names muhammad and ahmad come from the root hamida and hamd means to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised him. Angels have praised him and all of the prophets have praised him. And every single one of mankind praises him directly or indirectly. So he is praised in the heavens and in the earth, in the previous nations and in the present nation, in this dunya and in the akhirah. This is the ultimate praise. There is no human being before, now or after who is praised more than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says I have a number of names I am Muhammad and I am Ahmad the name Muhammad is mentioned four times in the Quran and the only time the name Ahmad is mentioned is from the tongue of Isa alaihi salam from the tongue of Jesus Christ peace be upon him Isa alaihi salam says there will be a messenger after me whose name will be Ahmad and Prophet sallallahu alaihi salam says I am al mahi the one whom allah erases kufr through through me allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe out kufr and i am al hashir people will be resurrected after me and i am al aqib the one who has no prophet after he is the last and final messenger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i am nabi ur rahma the prophet of mercy allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself called our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as rahmatul lil alamin Indeed Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mercy his sending is mercy his message is mercy his teachings are mercy and believing and acting upon what he has come with is a mercy and he says i am nabi at-tauba the prophet of tauba the prophet of repentance meaning by believing in him and following his teachings people can be forgiven and i am al-mukaffa the one who comes at the end and makes the message of previous prophets complete and i am nabi al malahim the prophet that will signal lots of trials and indeed the biggest trials the world will ever see will occur in this ummah there are many other names and titles for muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam inshallah that we can learn through the seerah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam describe him to me look at the description of your rasul I saw a man of striking appearance, radiant face, beautifully created, proportionate and delicate, finely made, a specimen of a creation. The Prophet ﷺ had an awe-inspiring appearance. His face was more radiant, more beautiful than the full moon on the darkest night. If the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had nothing but his presence, if he didn't recite anything, if he didn't say anything, you would look at him and you would already know that there was something divinely beautiful about him. With the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, everything was perfectly set. He wasn't too tall nor was he too short. His skin was not too light nor was it too dark. He had a bright skin color, but at the same time the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not pasty white. His face was not too round nor was it too narrow. but it was closer to being round sallallahu alaihi wasallam now if you're looking at the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i want you to imagine standing in front of him alaihi salatu wasallam 
The first thing you're going to do is you're going to connect with his eyes Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu eyes had a perfect contrast. The black was exceedingly black in his eyes and the white was exceedingly white. His eyelashes Alayhi Salatu Wasallam were so long that it looked like they naturally had kuhul, they naturally had an eyeliner on them. And they were always moist from his tears Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had these large curved eyebrows and they were full and they almost connected, but there was a beautiful space right between them where the light would shine. The Prophet ﷺ is described as having a prominent forehead. And in his forehead, there was a vein that would only show when he became upset ﷺ. As for his nose, his nose والسلام, was not flat, nor was it too pointy. But the Prophet ﷺ had a finely sloped nose. And they described it as having a unique glimmer to it. So. It shines in a way that when you were away from him وسلم, you might have assumed that it was larger than it actually was. But when you came close to him, you realized that it was just the shine of his nose that made it so prominent. When he opened his mouth وسلم, you would notice his teeth and they were perfectly set. Remember, he used to use the siwak at least five times a day. So his teeth والسلام, were described as white as hailstones and they weren't clustered together. They were set in a way that there was a fine line between each of those teeth. And his mouth alayhi salatu wasalam, was wide and he's described as having a perfect articulation and his voice was melodious. And his hair just like everything else is perfectly in the middle. It wasn't too straight nor was it too curly, but instead it was wavy hair. And the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam would keep it sometimes to his earlobes Sometimes he would let it go all the way to his shoulder Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, in times of Hajj and Umrah, he would shave his head Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He also had a dense full beard Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu used to comb his hair and he used to comb his beard. And they were fully black. And the Sahaba counted just between 14 and 20 gray hairs in his hair and his beard Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the time of his death. So he's 63 and he only had a few gray hairs Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his hair and his beard. And they said when he would use oil Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you couldn't even see them. And when you could see them, they were concentrated right under his lips Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on his sideburns Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. Then you come down to his neck and the Prophet Sallallahu had an elegant long neck. They said it was like the neck of a gazelle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then you looked at his shoulders. He had broad shoulders Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was strong strong arms alayhi salatu wasalam. He had a strong chest and even until the day of his death, his stomach never extended beyond his chest sallallahu alayhi wasalam. So he maintained his weight alayhi salatu wasalam and he maintained his fitness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam was not a hairy man. So other than his hair on his head and his beard, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam did not have much hair on the rest of his body. And he had a little bit of hair on his chest and a line that naturally ran down all the way to his navel Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then you come to his limbs and the Prophet Sallallahu is described as having well-defined big limbs. So he had big bones, big hands, big feet. He had large calves Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they said that his calves were perfectly round and then he had absolutely no weight on his heels Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. And his lower body was so strong Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to be able to jump on a horse and a camel and mount it with absolutely no saddle because of the strength of his lower body. Despite that, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that his hands and his feet were smoother than silk and water would slither right off of the hands and the feet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had a beautiful scent Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. He would sweat perfume Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you smelled his sweat, it smelled good. And if you shook the hand of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would maintain the scent of his hand on your hand for days after meeting him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had the best of breath Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Bara radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Wallahi, I went out one night and I saw the Prophet Sallallahu in this red garment and it was a red hulla from Yemen, his favorite garment to wear on occasions. And he said, I have never seen a sight more beautiful than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on that night. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, when I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was so perfectly set, it was as if he was molded in silver Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And the most famous thing about the Prophet ﷺ was his smile. He always was smiling Wasallam. SubhanAllah, in sadness and happiness, he always had a smile on his face Wasallam. And Ka'b ibn Malik anhu said that idha surra, when he was happy, then his face would become even more radiant Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was no man that smiled at his ummah more than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But at the same time, there was no man that wept for his ummah than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So during the day, in order to bring joy to the people, he smiled Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at them and that was from his generosity. And during the night, there was no man that would cry more than him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in front of his Lord also to bring joy and happiness and relief to his blessed Ummah. When he walked, he would walk briskly as if he's descending down a slope. Some scholars have also said that it is as if Allah made the earth humble to him, that wherever he's walking, it's as if the earth is is, is giving him the place to walk. And others said this is metaphorical. What it means is that, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ would walk briskly and he's walking so fast that most of us, we can only walk like that when we're going down an inclined plane. When he turned, he would turn to face with his whole body. So he's walking, somebody calls him, he turns to face him with his whole body. Between his two shoulders was the seal of the Prophethood. The Prophet ﷺ had a physical seal, a physical something. And this sign is the seal of the prophets. It is basically a outgrowth of hair in an area where hair does not grow and it is of a different color. And it was between his shoulder blades shaped like a pigeon's egg, an oval, small oval like a pigeon's egg. And in his voice was a natural echo. When he was silent, dignity covered him. And when he spoke, it was audible and clear almost commanding and overtaking. From afar, the most striking and outstanding in appearance. When he commanded, they used to compete to fulfill the command. Like when he used to speak, it was so coherently logical. It was smooth and easy to understand. He was to the point, not excessive, nor too short. His logic, his utterances, his words were like beads, like jewels coming out of a necklace, calculated, polished one after the other, it would flow magically. The people that were with him, they were working around him to try to serve and protect him. When he used to say something, they used to hearken to what he used to say. This is Muhammad Rasulullah. This is Muhammad Rasulullah. Anas ibn Malik says, I came out one night that was the full moon night. I looked at the moon and in the desert understand the moon is, is an awesome sight. It is smooth, it is radiant, it is clear, it is gentle compared to the scorching sun at which they are used to. So the moon was the epitome of beauty. So he says, I came out at a full moon night and I looked at the, at the moon and I saw it beautiful, handsome. So I said, let me go see if the moon is more handsome or my prophet is more handsome. Let me see if that is more beautiful or the prophet is more beautiful. So I went and I saw him standing afar. So I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and he said, Wallahi, he was more handsome than the moon in its entirety. That is just the look of your Rasul. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was sewing with the needle. My needle dropped in the dark. I couldn't find it. I said, Ya Rasul, I can't find it. He moved his face close and I swear, out of the radiance of his face, I found my needle. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was mind bogglingly handsome. But his handsomeness was covered with waqar in Jalal in Haybah. The Sahaba say, when we used to sit at his feet, two feelings conflicting would come on the heart. The first one, you wanted to look at him. You wanted to behold the majesty of his face. And when you wanted to look up, shyness used to overtake you, so you used to look down. At the same instance, two conflict. Amr ibn al-As says, I sat with him many times, but if you ask me to describe his face, I can't describe it. I couldn't look up at him. 
because it was difficult to penetrate the awe and the splendor of the Rasul. More beautiful than you, my eyes have never seen. More beautiful than you, the women have never given birth to. You have been created free from all flaws, physical flaws. As though you have been created how you wanted to be created. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the best of creation in such a way that just by looking at him, you'd love him. Subhanallah. Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu anhu, he was a Jewish rabbi. When he saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the first time, he said, as soon as I saw this face, I knew this is not the face of a liar. This man utters the truth. He is the Nabi. And immediately that same majlis, the same sitting, he had accepted Islam. Because he heard the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, those are the words of a messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us truthful. As for his specialities, something that only he was given and no other human being was given. Number one, he is the final prophet of Allah. And there's only one prophet that can be the final. And Allah chose him to be the final prophet. Number two, the prophethood of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been decreed by Allah even before Adam Alaihi Salam existed. Even before the Ruh was blown into Adam. Of the specialities of our Prophet Sallallahu number three, is that he is the only Prophet to have been sent for all of humanity. In fact, the only Prophet to have been sent even to the jinn. No prophet before our Prophet was sent to all of humanity. No prophet. Every single prophet was sent to a specific nation. Of the specialities of our Prophet Wasallam, our Prophet Wasallam said that Allah has helped me with ru'ub. Ru'ub means a type of fear that Allah will inflict into my enemies even before I reach them. That when he went into battle against an enemy, then the people began became terrified of him even before he reached them. Of the specialities that he has been given was that he has been given the largest ummah out of all of the prophets. Of his specialities that no other prophet has been given is that he has been given the most powerful miracle and that is the miracle of the Qur'an. There is no miracle that compares to the Qur'an. Look at any other miracle that you can imagine, the splitting of the Red Sea, all of these miracles, we have no access to them. We didn't see the splitting of the Red Sea. It's not really a miracle for me and you, except that we believe in it. But the Quran is a miracle I can recite and the people can hear. It's a living miracle. Of the specialities that our Prophet has been given, is the night journey of al Isra wal Mi'raj. No other Prophet has had the privilege of undertaking this journey. The only human being to have been called up to the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. Of his specialities that he was given is that he is the leader of all of humanity and he deserves to be the leader of humanity and he will be the leader of humanity on the day of judgment. Of the blessings that are unique to him is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be the very first human being to be resurrected on the Day of Judgment, as we said. The first grave to open up when the second trumpet is blown. The Prophet ﷺ said, the first grave that will crack open will be mine. Of the specialities that he has been given, is that he will be given the largest hawd. And hawd is a pool that our Prophet ﷺ has been promised. Of his speciality is the Kawthar. He has been given the main river of Jannah. And all the rivers of Jannah split from that. It is as if the people of Jannah will drink water from the gift of the Prophet ﷺ. Of his specialities is, he will be the first to cross over the Sirat. And he will be the one guiding his Ummah to Jannah. And he will be the first to knock on the doors of Jannah. And he will be the first human being 
to ever enter Jannah after our father Adam has left it. And he will be the one in whose name the gates of Jannah will be opened. And then his ummah will be the first ummah, even though we are the last ummah chronologically. But because we are his ummah, and because we are his followers, Allah will bless us, and Allah will gift us, and Allah will honor us, not because of us, but because of him. And we will be asked to enter along with him. So we will be the first ummah to enter Jannah, even though we are the last ummah chronologically. The final speciality that will be mentioned is that Allah has blessed him with the highest level of Jannah. It is a level that is the pinnacle of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. It is an entire level. Some scholars have said that Jannah, you can look at it kind of like a pyramid in that the higher up you go, the fewer the people. So Jannah will be more populated at the lower levels. And the higher up you go, fewer and fewer people will be able to get to those levels. And there will come a point and there will come a level that is an entire level of Jannah. And that is meant for only one person. The whole plane of that field of Jannah is only meant for one person. And it is the pinnacle of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la and it is immediately underneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is called Al-Fadila and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this Fadila it is a level of Jannah that Allah has chosen for only one of his servants and then he said modestly that I hope that that I am that person in Mecca where he was born He was known as Al-Amin, the most trustworthy. Even though his enemies had stole from his followers, killed his followers, tortured his followers, confiscated their properties, he could have done what others do in warfare. He could have then confiscated their wealth that he was holding. But when they entered his home to kill him, they did not find him there. Instead, they found his cousin Ali radiallahu an. And he left Ali in his house when he escaped for only one reason. So that Ali radiallahu an could give back to them the valuables, the money that they had entrusted with him years ago. Can you imagine a man who is hated for his message opposed for his message, sought to be killed. Yet those people who hated the message and sought to kill him, they never thought to come and say, give us back our money. Because still they trusted him. Because they knew there was no one with more trust in Mecca than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many of us are truthful and trustworthy? How many of the youth out here are trustworthy and truthful? That was young age, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But at the same time, how many of us would be able to follow that example and say, yes, I am also a truthful person, upright, and I am honest. Take a look at Khadija binti Khawailid radiallahu anha. When she had sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his agreement to Asham in order to trade, when he came back, she praised him so much. This is the most honest businessman ever. Subhanallah. When Quraysh had a problem prior to prophethood, they called on this man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to help them arrive at a conclusion. This is something unique. How many of us would ever be called upon in order to conclude something or are we a part of the problem? That will determine how far or close you are to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's example. How much you really consider him a role model. A role model is a person you look up to and follow. You want to be like. He is the only role model that is supremely in every single aspect of life. Amazing. So where is your truthfulness? Here is a woman who wanted to marry him. And subhanallah, based on the fact that his character was absolutely amazing. His conduct, the accountability, the fact that every little portion of wealth was recorded and every little portion was accounted for. Subhanallah. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many of us in business, we are not transparent. We have a problem with our partners, with those we actually sell things to. And with those we buy from, we haven't even cleared the accounts. 
Where are you? Where is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Apply it in your lives. No point in saying, "Oh, I consider him a role model, but you are cheating people in business. You are shortchanging people." Prior to prophethood, you've already learned. You want to follow this man? Subhanallah, he has had a record that is spotless, speckless, absolutely amazing, totally perfect. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's move further. The example of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he came down from the cave of Hira with prophethood, the first person he confided in was his wife. How many of us, when we have a big problem, we would confide in our own spouses? A lot of us would not do that. A lot of us would hide our issues from our spouses, either because we have a problem or they have a problem, or both of us have a problem. But if you're close to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and your aim is to please Allah, you will never ever have to hide things from your spouses. That was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when his wife comforted him. She gave him a big tight hug, and this goes to show Subhanallah that a tight hug really helps. A big enveloping hug would actually help. It is a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He came down saying, "Zammiluni, zammiluni, cover me, cover." And you know, the, the two surahs, "Muzammil, Muddathir," referring to the enveloped one, the one who was hugged. Subhanallah. Even in the romantic aspect of life with your own spouse, he was a champion. Subhanallah. Take a look at Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Here, his wife tells him. Nay, indeed, Allah will never ever let you down. Why? Because you are a person who looks after your family members. That's an example of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These family members, the kuffar of Quraysh, they were family members of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. From among them, and what did he do? He always was kind towards them, but he gave them the message. He was always good. He never swore. He never did he use a bad word. From his mouth, never. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Today we are quick in calling people kafir, in calling people bad names, in calling people, and we claim to be followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Where did he do that? In his midst lived hypocrites. Still, he treated them with kindness. When you have a person uttering dirty words, tell yourself, Wallahi, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not only never uttered a bad word, but he said. A true believer is never vulgar, never disrespectful, never abusive. He doesn't utter words that are hurtful from his mouth against someone. If we look further into the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we will find that Khadija bint Khawailid radiyallahu anha. She says, "Allah will never let you down. You go out to mend the relationships that may be broken. You make an effort to go and to fix up relations." So when someone is not talking to you, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go and he would try make an effort to resolve the matter as best as he can without compromising what Allah has brought. Subhanahu wa taala. How many of you can say that when there has been a problem, I have tried my best to resolve the matter. I have tried my best. I've gone. You may not be able to solve it, but did you try? And how hard did you try? And are you prepared to go and try again and again? That is. Following Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Similarly, the narration speaks. The same narration speaks of how Khadija bint Khawailid radiyallahu anha was bearing witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to help those in need. Today, people in need, do we really help them? And if we help them, do we brag about it? Do we make a show about it, or do we help them for the sake of Allah? In a way taught by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, when a charity is given, even the left hand does not know what the right hand has spent, then that is the charity. How many of us do that? We reach out, or are we selfish? We want everything for ourselves. Even in our own homes, the opinions are only ours. We pick on everybody else. When are you going to give someone else in your house an opinion? Someone else within your home, a statement. Every day it's your way. Today let it be someone else's way. Subhanallah. It doesn't mean you're the husband, you're the father, so you're the boss of the home in a way that you can boss people around. No way. That's not Islam. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the role model, used to help in the house. He used to milk the goat. He used to assist in cleaning the home. How many of you do that? I think a lot of us, a lot of us, would be guilty of not doing enough in that regard. How many of you would help in the kitchen? How many of you would help washing the clothes? How many of you would help sweep and clean up? 
How many of you would help when it comes to ironing your clothes? How many of you would help when it comes to going out and perhaps getting some milk or something else? Today we might not be milking the goat and in some places you may be, but you might not be milking it, but even to go out to the store to buy it and to bring it back home, that is a good deed. In fact, it would be following the sunnah of Muhammad وسلم, to assist in bringing the milk along. Allahu Akbar. He was concerned about the welfare of others. He used to help people at times of need. Let us take a look later on in the life of Muhammad sallallahu He was so concerned about the guidance of the rest of the people. So he calls the people of Quraysh and he called them to Mount Safa and he asked them a question. He says, oh, you people of Quraysh, my family members, kinsmen and so on. If I were to tell you that there is an army behind this mountain ready to attack you, would you believe? They said, indeed, we would believe you've never told a lie. You are an honest, you are known amongst us as as sadiqul Amin, As we said earlier, the truthful one, the honest one, the trustworthy one. Why would we disbelieve? So he said, I am warning you about a punishment that is about to come to you unless you believe in one Allah, the maker alone. Immediately they uttered bad words. Abu Lahab says, Tabbalaka ya Muhammad, destruction be to you, O Muhammad. Ali hadha jama'atana, is this why you gathered us? And verses were revealed later on, mentioning the destruction of Abu Lahab. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, how did he react to that? Did he swear back? No, he didn't. From even thinking of that, he did not utter a single bad word. He was quiet. He took it. Today, for us, how would we take someone who criticizes us? Would we get up and say the same vulgar words as they say? Or would we be sensible about the whole thing? Yes, you have every right to react, but your reaction must be noble. From your reaction, people must be able to pick up that this is prophetic. It is noble. It is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is sensible. It is something that a sane, mature human being who's a mu'min, who has belief, who wants to emulate the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do. They started spreading rumor saying he's a magician. He's after power. He's after wealth. He's after this and he's after that. He wants to be the leader. That's all. He is seeking attention. Never ever did he accuse them of the same. Not once. He remained silent. He knows that I am working for Allah. Allah is my boss. Supreme. Allah is the creator, maker, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer. Allah is Rabbul Alameen. So immediately he knew that the best way to deal with these people is to listen to what they have to say, respond in the best manner as per Allah's instruction and remain silent thereafter. Pray for them. They need your prayers. Today with our enemies, they say something against you or against me. Immediately, a lot of us would just raise our hands and say, oh Allah, destroy this person. Oh Allah, break them. Oh Allah, finish them up. Well, if that was the case, the whole world would be finished up because you are praying for my destruction. I am praying for your destruction. That's not prophetic. How many of us have raised our hands and said, Oh Allah, help him. Oh Allah, guide them. These people don't know. Take a look at Ta'if. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Ta'if, you and I know what happened there. How did he react? That is the role model. That is the ultimate role model. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Oh Allah, guide my people because indeed they don't know. When the angels came and offered to destroy the whole lot of them by bringing the two mounts together, he said, No way. I have been sent as a mercy. I've been sent as a mercy to the worlds, not as a means of their destruction. If they don't accept, perhaps their children will accept. Amazing. Look at how Muhammad sallallahu used to think. Take a look at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. What did he do? He spoke to the Kuffar. He tried to strike with them a treaty and he struck it. Even though they suggested some things that were considered unacceptable by some of the companions. But Muhammad sallallahu said, no problem. If that is going to bring about peace, we will sign it. Meaning we will agree upon it. How many of us, we don't even make peace in our own homes, within our own communities, within the Muslim Ummah. We don't want to make peace. We want to create war within the Ummah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hudaybiyah was making peace with his enemies. Those who came out to fight him. Those who drove him away from his own home. Those who drove him his, and his companions away. Those who killed some of his companions and who were keen on doing the same to him. And yet he's signing with them a treaty. If there's going to be peace, let there be peace. Allah will guide us. Allah will protect us. When it came to the wars that took place, he made it very clear 
you don't harm a female, you don't harm a child, you don't harm an elderly person, you do not break trees, you do not destroy infrastructure. Today, people are doing all of those things in the name of the same Islam. Where are they? Where is the following of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We believe it is correct and it is absolutely perfect in terms of an example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam up to the end of time, right up to the end of time. When he said, do not fight those who put their weapons down. You're not even supposed to fight them as they put their weapons down and they say, we don't want to fight those who enter their homes and close the doors. The reason I'm making mention of this is there are deviant groups who happen to massacre innocent women, children, they destroy infrastructure, they cause harm, they create chaos, they cause problems for the Muslim Ummah to begin with and then the others in the name of Islam, in your name and mine. This is not the example of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the role model of compassion. Like he says, I was sent as a mercy. If he was sent as a mercy, we need to be merciful as well. We need to understand Islam will spread when we spread this love and this mercy and the peace and we educate people as to how we are meant to be coexisting. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam struck a deal with the people in Medina Munawwara who were not even Muslim. They were people of the book and some of them were idol worshippers. Peaceful coexistence in a nutshell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand this beautiful example of the most noble of all prophets, the highest of all creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you hear his name and you do not utter the term sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or you do not say peace be upon him, you have disrespected him. Did you know that? There is a curse upon a person who just utters that name disrespectfully on its own. People have tried to tarnish the image of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No way, they will not manage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Indeed, we have protected you against those who want to scoff, who want to mock, who want to joke about you. This would include anyone up to the end of time. We have protected your reputation. We have protected who you are. They can say whatever they want. Wallahi, the more they say, the more the people are entering the fold of Islam. The more others are beginning to love the faith. They can do what they want to extinguish that powerful example. They will never be able to do that. May Allah help us promote love, promote mercy, promote kindness. May Allah help us to solve our matters between us so that we can live as an ummah. Let's take a look at Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. Wallahi, I served the messenger, may peace be upon him, for 10 whole years. Imagine 10 years. I served Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what does he say? فَمَا قَالَ لِيَ أُفٍ قَطُّ وَمَا قَالَ لِشَيْءٍ صَنَعْتُهُ لِمَا صَنَعْتَهُ He has never ever told me a single hurtful word. And I was working for him. Not one oof. He didn't even make a gesture or a noise, a sound that was derogatory or negative. Never did he say oof to me. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Never did he say for anything that I did. Why did you do this? If I did something wrong, he would correct it himself with a smile. How many of us, those who work for us, we are so bad to them. We are rude to them. We treat them like they are not human beings. We abuse them in whatever way. We don't pay them, we should change them. We treat them like they are animals and we claim to be Muslimin. A man with a huge vision. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best of Allah's creation, was physically abused. Dirt was poured on his blessed back and he is in sajda and he didn't lift his, himself up from the sajda. He stayed. Someone went and told Fatima to Zahra, they have just poured dirt on the back of your father. She came crying, young girl at that stage, and she's cleaning the dirt and cursing them. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Don't worry, ya Fatima. Don't worry, my little daughter. What your father has brought will go to every house on the planet. Do you see the vision? At what time? Where he can't protect himself. The Prophet ﷺ was brave, brave in, in following his vision and brave in nature. The Rasul was brave, but whilst he was brave, he wasn't arrogant. Bravery means to overcome your fears. The Rasul was humble. He conquered Mecca. 
10,000 men have come into the city which tortured him and hurt him and kicked him out and killed his companions and imprisoned him. He is walking as a con he comes in victorious. But how did he ride into the city? The Ashab say he lowered himself and humbled himself so much that his beard was hitting the back of his camel to show that I haven't come in arrogance, Ya Rabb. Learn modesty from your Rasul. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best of you are those who are best to his wives and his family, and I am the best of you. He was the Rasul of Allah. And look at his relationship with his wives and with his family. He used to play with them, entertain them, laugh with them, joke with them, eat with them. When he came into the house, it wasn't like a dark cloud came into the house. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I have a son, as in the radiant sun, and the skies have a son. The Rasul was sunshine to his household. What will your wife say about you? Aisha radiallahu anha says, when I was younger and more agile and more fit, the Prophet raced me or chased me and I ran and overtook him. I beat him. Years passed. Aisha radiallahu anha put on weight. She became bigger. And the Prophet is in a campaign. He's traveling with the Ashab. And then in the middle of the desert, learn, learn love from your Rasul. In the middle of the desert, he tells the army, go ahead, go ahead. Me and my wife will stay back a little. So when they're gone and out of sight, so the Prophet wasallam looks at her and says, you want to race? Ah, salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayka ya Rasulullah. So can you imagine our mother Aisha getting ready to race? So they stood. And they ran and the Prophet Sallallahu beat her, won the race. So he said, this one for that one. And the sweetness of joking, it wasn't rude and vulgar and obscene and over the top and difficult. This one for that one. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha Radiallahu Anha says, I used to watch him from the corner of my eyes when we used to eat. So I used to take a piece of meat to a morsel of meat and bite it and put it back in the plate. He used to pick up that morsel, turn it to where my mouth had touched it and bite from the same place and look at me and I would blush. There was a group of Abyssinians doing sword play in the courtyard of the masjid. She wanted to watch Aisha. So she said, can I watch? So the Prophet stood in front of her to let her watch from over his shoulder so that she's covered behind him. And she watched and she's enjoying it and she's young and the Rasul is older. Life is much more serious from where he stands. So he stood and stood and stood and then he said, is it enough ya Aisha? And she says, I wanted to see how much he loves me. So I said, no, stay. So he, she said, I watched him change legs. You know, like a person gets tired and they swap legs like that. I watched him like that. And she says, I asked him, what is your love for me like? So he said, like a knot, tight. So she used to ask, you know, as the days used to go by, how was the knot? So he used to say, ala haliha. As it was, as it was, learn to live from your Prophet Muslims. The Rasul was gracious. He won the world with his kindness. He won the world with his love. He won the world with a heart like an ocean. He didn't win the world by the stupidity that you see around you today. It is not an achievement. Warabul Kaaba, it is not an achievement. The Prophet وسلم, never drank alcohol throughout his life, never used any kind of intoxicant. He never committed fornication or adultery. In fact, he وسلم, 
never looked upon a naked woman ever in his life. He never looked upon any woman with lust in his entire life. The Prophet wasallam never in his life did he ever lift his hand to hit any human being ever. Not a servant, not a wife, not a child. He was as gentle. He was as shy as a virgin on her wedding night, hiding behind a curtain. He was that kind of man. He was that pious. He was that shy. He was that gentle in his speech. Yet it was said that when the Prophet ﷺ was met on a battlefield, he was ferocious in defending Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the companions of the Prophet ﷺ used to look for him on the battlefield, they said, Wallahi, we found him in the middle of the enemies fighting. And they said, we used to hide behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the battlefield. He was such a warrior and statesman on the battlefield, commanding and fighting for the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But once he was off the battlefield, his eyes were downcast and he was speaking softly and caring and crying because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentioned O oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have been sent as a mercy to the whole world. So he was a mercy even to those people who are ignorant of him, they are benefiting from that mercy. And when a Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, demanding that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give him some share in the zakah, the charity. And that man came to the Prophet وسلم, grabbing his coat like this, saying, give to me my share. Until a mark was made on the neck of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions also wanted to kill that man. The Prophet وسلم, told them, leave him. Leave him. And the Prophet وسلم, he smiled. He said, what do you want? The man said, give me. And the Prophet continued to give him until he said, I have enough. And that man left. This was the manner of the Prophet وسلم, His tolerance, his mercy, his patience, his integrity. The Prophet وسلم, never, he never wore silk. He never wore gold. He never dressed arrogantly. He never walked proud, arrogant. He never appeared in front of people like he was a king or an emperor, even when he was the absolute ruler. And it was common for people to look around and want to think he should be sitting up someplace in a chair on a throne like other leaders. He should be wearing some gown of gold he should be wearing some kind of crown. But when they came in and they looked around, it was a common question. Who is Muhammad? Where is he? No one could tell who was the Prophet وسلم, among his followers because his clothes and what he ate and where he chose to sit was never different from the other people. Name one leader in the world that could compare with that. And he was always generous. And when someone asked him for something, he gave everything to them, never caring about himself. And the Prophet وسلم, he used to sleep on a mat, only thing it was made from palm fiber, from dried grass. And that's how he slept. And his back had marks in it from that dry mat that he used to lay down on with no furniture in his house. And one day, Umar ibn al-Khattab entered the house of the Prophet وسلم, and saw that he was sleeping on the dirt floor. And Umar, he said, Ya Rasulullah, the kings, the emperors, 
in the earth, in Persia, in Byzantium, in Habash, all over the world, these kings, they are not like you. Oh Rasulullah, you can have better than this. And the Prophet dismissed him and said, they have what they have been given and I have what I have been given. O oh, Muslims, O oh, non-Muslims, think about this kind of man. Have you heard of such a man? Have you ever seen such a man? Have you read about such a man? Never. You cannot even imagine this kind of man. Feeding the poor, visiting the sick, discharging the army, acting as a statesman, acting as an arbiter, talking to the people, addressing the women, giving out the zakah, giving the ahkam and the rulings, explaining the Quran, sewing his clothes, washing his house, shopping for the food, and at night standing in prayer for four or five hours at a time. How could a man do all of that and stand four or five hours at night at one time? He was just and he was fair. He didn't make judgments for those who he liked and made judgments against those he didn't like, like the kings, like the presidents, like the chairmen, like the rich people, like the judges of today, and like those who have done it throughout history. And he said, Wallahi, if Fatima, my daughter, the daughter of Muhammad, if she stole, I would cut off her hands. I love her as I love myself. But if she stole, I will cut off her hands. This is the kind of judge he was. A man by the name of Michael Hart. And who was Michael Hart? Michael Hart was a contemporary historian and mathematician. And he gathered other historians and biographers together. And they said, let us compile a list of the hundred most profound human beings in history. And to make a long story short, they made a category. They set up 32 different categories by which to compare and produce these hundred most great profound human beings. And let me tell you what Michael Hart said. He said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he placed him at the head of his list. And those with him could not dispute it because categorically he earned that position. And Michael Hart said, my choice is Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular levels. And so Michael Hart and his other collaborators, they said, the greatest human being that has impacted history and all annals of documented history, it had to be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The bed that the Prophet Sallallahu would sleep on was a leather skin that was sometimes you would stuff it with date palm leaves. Leather is not what you sleep on. Leather is something you put on the, the saddle. Once it is narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu bed, one of his wives, she folded up her own half to give him extra, right? So she made it a little bit more comfortable. Because it was more comfortable, he slept longer than usual. And then when he woke up, he said, what happened? Who did this? So when she explained, he rebuked her and said, bring it back to the way it was. I need to pray my tahajjud basically. I need to wake up for tahajjud. Don't make my bed too soft for me. He wanted a bed that is a little bit, little bit harsh because it provides him now opportunity to pray tahajjud. And sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as Aisha says, would not taste meat for six weeks. For six weeks he would not eat meat. And even by the time of the tabi'un, this was unbelievable. So Urwa, 40 years later is saying, Oh my mother, how did you live? So she said, by eating al-aswadan, the two dark things. Dates and dirty water, because they didn't have this clean filtered water, did they? They get their water from the well, 
they get their water from the streams and there is no purification system. And once Abdurrahman ibn Auf, now Abdurrahman ibn Auf, as you all know, he was a businessman. And so once many years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he is brought a dish with meat and with bread. And as soon as he saw this platter, he began to cry. He was asked, oh Abdurrahman ibn Auf, why are you crying? He said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, till the day that he died, he never ate wheat bread to his fill. Forget with the meat. He never ate wheat bread to his fill and not even his family. Not one day they could eat to their full. As for Aisha, many times it is narrated that she would begin to cry when food, good food was given to her. That when she saw all of this food, she would begin to cry. And she would say the same thing that the Prophet ﷺ never ate rusty bread or hard bread to his fill even one day in his life. He never got to eat all of this full. Of course he ate bread, but to his full, even one day of his life. And we all know the story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Abu Bakr and Umar, the famous story reported in Tirmidhi, that Umar ibn al-Khattab did not have anything to eat. And so once Umar ibn al-Khattab is walking in the streets and he sees the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam sitting, and this is at noon. And at noon, nobody walks in the streets in the summertime. It's too hot. So he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing outside? And the Prophet knows that Umar is outside for one reason. And that is he doesn't have food at home. So he says the same reason as you. And as they're sitting there, Abu Bakr as well is walking. Because you cannot sit at home and you're hungry. You just want to walk around, just go outside. The three of them are sitting there just talking. When one of the Sahaba, Abu Haytham, is rushing back to home from work. So he finishes his story, he's rushing home. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, what are you three doing at this time of the day? And so Umar says, well, we didn't have anything to eat, so we're just sitting here basically talking. So Abu Haytham says, no, this is not possible. This is not possible. That the three best people now you're sitting here. So he tells them, come to my house and I'll give you food. So he rushes home. He only has one goat that is past the age of giving milk. It's an old goat. So he tells his wife, by Allah, we need to sacrifice this goat. And so the Prophet says, Abu Bakr and Umar, they came and they ate meat and bread, which is of course the uh, luxurious food item of that time and to this day. And then what was the response of the Prophet when he finished all of this? After not having anything at home, he reminded Abu Bakr and Umar that they left their houses hungry and Allah gave them this meal. Ya Abu Bakr and Umar, Allah is going to ask you on that day about this food. What did you do with it? And did you thank me enough for it? Three meals a day, we don't even think about Allah's blessings, right? And, and the Prophet ﷺ is so conscious that Allah is going to ask you about this Naim. And as for his humility, the Prophet ﷺ frequently rode donkeys. And even though he had the money to purchase a horse and a camel, and he had a camel, al qaswa he had a camel. But the Prophet ﷺ had no problem riding a donkey frequently. And during the battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ had to distribute the camels amongst the entire group of people. Okay, every single camel was given. Roughly it came out to three people per camel. Has to be divided. And so the Prophet ﷺ assigned Ali and Abu Lubaba to himself. So the one camel with these three people. So Ali says, Ya Rasulullah, both of us are young men. Ya Rasulullah, we're young. You, 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 had, you go ahead and ride the camel. Now, there's many things. The Prophet ﷺ could have said, Okay, fine. And subhanAllah, he is the leader, by the way. And wallahi, forget everything aside. The leader deserves extra protection. So he could have said, okay, fine. And nobody would have said anything. Or he even could have said, no, no, let's all share it. But he didn't want to make them feel that I'm doing you a favor by doing this. What did he say? He smiled back at them. And he said, neither are the two of you any stronger than me. And nor am I in any lesser need of the reward than you two for walking and struggling. So we're going to share the camel. And as for his good manners, Anas ibn Malik said that once the Prophet ﷺ sent me on a chore to do, and on the way I saw some kids playing. So I started playing with them. Anas is a kid in the end of the day, you know, he's seven years old in the end of the day, right? So he's going to do the chore, he finds some kids playing, and I completely forgot about the chore. And then the Prophet ﷺ came out in search that whatever the chore was, it's not happening. And he finds Anas playing with the street children there. And so somebody held on to my ears and picked me up, and I turned around and it was the Prophet ﷺ smiling at me. It's like playing with him, playing with him, not even getting irritated at him. And SubhanAllah, where, where do we stand? 
when it comes to our own families and how easy it is to get irritated and get angry. But again, he is our role model, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And even when people showed him the utmost contempt and the utmost disrespect, he maintained his dignity and his composure. Once a group of Yahud came and they wanted to mock him and they said, winking at one another, Assamu alaykum, Assamu alaykum. Not as-salam, as-sam. And as-sam means may death be upon you, may a curse be upon you. And so the Prophet ﷺ maintained his composure and said, Wa alaykum. Aisha got so angry that from behind the curtain she screamed out, May you be cursed and may Allah Azza wa Jal cause you to perish. How dare you say this to the Prophet ﷺ? Prophet ﷺ rebuked Aisha and said, Calm down, O Aisha, calm down. Don't you know that whatever is gentle, is beautiful. And whenever gentleness is in something, it makes it beautiful. And whenever harshness is in something, it makes it ugly. So after they left, she said, Ya Rasulullah, how could you have controlled your temper? They came and they cursed you and they said, Assalamu alaikum. So he responded, didn't you hear my response? Wa alaikum, back to you. But he maintained his dignity and his composure. And as for his bravery, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that once in Medina, in the middle of the night, the people heard a loud commotion and a loud sound coming. And they didn't know what it was. So timidly, they came outside. What is happening? And they found that the Prophet ﷺ had already gone in the direction of the sound alone. And he found the horse of Abu Talha and he simply rode it without a saddle. And he's galloping towards the sound and he had his sword around his neck. And he's coming back to the people of Medina saying, you have nothing to fear, I've checked it out, you have nothing to fear. What does that show us of the bravery? That he hears the sound, he's the first person to go, jump on a horse without even the saddle, takes his sword, run, and then he's running back to the people of Medina, I've checked it out, nothing to fear. Whatever it was, it wasn't anything for them to be worried about. This is the bravery of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As for his generosity, the Prophet Sallallahu would never refuse any request. It is once narrated that the Prophet ﷺ was wearing a garment that had holes in it. It was not appropriate that the Prophet ﷺ was wearing a garment like this. So one of the Sahaba gifted him a very beautiful and a very good garment. And he went home and he wore that garment and he came outside. One of the Sahaba immediately said, Ya Rasulullah, can you give me this garment as a gift? So the Prophet ﷺ turned to him and said, Naam. Yes. He went back home. He wore the same clothes that he had just took off. He'd literally been wearing it for one minute. And he came back wearing the tattered garment and he gave him the new one. After a while, he went back inside his house. All of the Sahaba, they jumped on this other one. How could you have asked the Prophet You knew he wouldn't, look at what they said. You knew that he would never turn down a request. You knew that he wouldn't say no to you. How could you do this? So he said, before you get angry at me, I'm not doing this to wear. I want to use this as my kafan, as my cloth to be buried in. That's why I did it. Along with all of these, the Prophet ﷺ actually was also a person who was blessed with a great sense of humor. Having humor shows your humanity. It shows your down-to-earthliness as they say. And there are so many instances of the jokes of the Prophet ﷺ. And all of the jokes of the Prophet ﷺ, they are pure. And they are clean and they are truthful. And of the instances is an old lady coming to the Prophet ﷺ. An old lady coming to the Prophet ﷺ saying, O Messenger of Allah, make dua that Allah causes me to enter Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at her and said, O my aunt, haven't you been informed that old ladies cannot enter Jannah? Old ladies cannot enter Jannah. And she began wailing and crying and what am I going to do now? And then he told her that, don't cry, don't cry. For wallahi, all ladies cannot enter Jannah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make her into a young fair maiden and then she will enter Jannah. Give her glad tidings. Is that you're not going to be an old lady when you enter Jannah, you're going to be a young, you're going to go back to your, your days as a lovely maiden. That's how you will enter Jannah. And then he recited the verse, Inna ansha'na hunna insha'a. We bring them forth with a new beginning. The story of Aisha radiallahu anha, when the Prophet ﷺ was on his deathbed, Aisha herself felt a little bit sick on one of the days and she had a severe headache. She had a severe headache. 
And so she was crying out, Oh my head, oh my head. It's her crying out. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Rather, oh my head, I have a worse headache than you. He understands he's about to die. So to calm her down, to crack some jokes, in the days of his death, he says, Oh Aisha, and what would you lose if you died right now? And the one to do ghusl for you, and to bury you, and to pray your janazah would be me. In other words, what a great honor. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, she smirks back at him and she says, I'm sure you would like that to happen because then you would be free to go to your other wives. So she's saying, I know that when I go away, khalas, you will, you will have free access to all of them after that. Now, this joking that he's doing on his deathbed, subhanAllah, scholars of fiqh have derived fiqh from this. And they have talked about the permissibility of a spouse doing ghusl for his or her spouse. From this joke, they derive fiqh. Because he never spoke except the truth. There was a young man by the name of Zahir, whom the Prophet ﷺ used to love a lot. The Prophet ﷺ saw him in the marketplace selling some things. And he's screaming out, who's gonna buy this from me? Who's gonna buy this from me? And so the Prophet ﷺ came from behind, quietly. He's literally playing a practical joke on Zahir. He came quietly from behind and he grabbed him. Zahir is standing up. He grabbed him from behind and he basically locked him. He gave him a lock, a bear lock, a hug. So Zahid is trying to see, who is this? What are you doing? Let go of me. I'm trying to sell my stuff here. And when he saw it was none other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, immediately he became limp and he touched as much of the chest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he could to get the barakah from his body. Began to touch the, the body of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began joking and crying out in the suq, who is gonna buy this from me? Who is gonna buy this abd from me? Now, in a marketplace in those days, when you're saying who's gonna buy the abd, you mean the slave, right? But of course, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's true, Zahir was not an abd to mankind, but he was an abd of Allah. So even in this joke, he's not saying any lie. So Zahir says, Ya Rasulullah, in that case, you're gonna get a very bad bargain if you're gonna sell me. I'm not gonna be very, very expensive. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّكَ لَثَمِينٌ You are very expensive in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a beautiful story here that shows us the humanity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam during the last year of his life, our Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he made hajj at the end of this pilgrimage. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam called all of the Muslims to gather around him. And Umar was standing next to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. And he said, our messenger alayhi salatu was salam first and foremost told us to pay very close attention to what he had to say. For he did not know whether he would be with us again. He told the people in front of him, the white of you is not better than the black of you and the black of you is not better than the white of you. The Arab is not better than the non-Arab and the non-Arab is not better than the Arab. You're all the same in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're equal. The only of you that is better than the other one is the one who has more taqwa. And when it comes to nationality, when it comes to where you're from, you're all the same. He also abolished shirk and said never worship anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he forbade shirk to ever enter into the Arabian Peninsula ever again. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam also spoke about women and told the brothers specifically that your women, your wives, your sisters, your mothers, they are an amana, they are a trust. Be careful in how you are dutiful towards them. We can never undervalue our sisters. Our mothers, our daughters, our sisters are the institutions of knowledge for our children. He also abolished riba, abolished cheating one another in business, taking money unlawfully, earn what you earn. But he said something in this khutbah which affects me very much. He told the people in front of him, those of you who are here today, those of you who are listening to my words, Convey this message to those that are not here. Convey this message to those that are not here. For it may be that the one you tell this message to from me, 
may even understand it better than you. We were given such a ni'mah on that day that created an ummah. There would be kuntum khayran ummatin ukhrija lin nas. There would be the best nation that Allah had ever brought forward for mankind. You see, every other prophet that came before our Prophet والسلام, he delivered his message to his ummah and then his farewell message to his ummah was to hold on to the message until the next prophet came. Why? Because another Nabi was coming, another prophet was coming, another messenger was coming. Allah would continue to send wahi down. So just hold on to what you have. But our Prophet, our Messenger وسلم, was Khatib and Nabiyeen. He was the seal of all Prophets. He was the end of it. There would be no more after him. So he understood that my life is coming to an end. But there are going to be generations after me. I am only the first sign of the day of Qiyamah. There will be many more people to come after me. This message from Allah has to continue to be delivered to mankind. So who's going to do the job? On that day, he took the torch of conveying the message, the torch of Risala of conveying the message to mankind. And that torch before him had only been handed from Jibreel alayhi salam to the Anbiya. Our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam looked at us and he handed us that torch. And he said, the job that I did for the past 23 years, that's now your job. That's what you're going to do. On that day, Allah made us the greatest nation because we do the greatest work. It's not for any reason that Allah told his prophet that your ummah will be the best ummah, the greatest ummah, the biggest ummah. And on the day of Qiyamah, I will make them the first ummah in front of everyone. That's not for no reason. That's the izzah that this ummah has, is that we follow the greatest prophet who gave us the greatest task. And he said, Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. I have given them the message. Oh Allah, bear witness three times. I've given them the message. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azza wa jal jala wa ala responded to him al yawm On the backs of this nation, Allah said, This day have I completed your religion. The way of life that Allah began with Adam alayhi salam and he passed down through the Anbiya. Allah decided that on the backs of this ummah, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I'm going to complete my way of life for mankind. What an honor. We don't need to walk around as if we have some dark cloud over our head. We are Muslims, alhamdulillah, Allah has given us honor. We are not only Muslims, but we can say, I believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The last week of the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu wasalam. So one morning, he went to the graveyard of Baqi in Medina. And he went with Abu Huraira and some of the other companions. You see, our Prophet felt like death might be approaching him. And he makes a very long dua for the people of Baqi. And he says to them, you've beaten us. He says to the people of Baqi, you've beaten us to the next life. But we, inshallah, will join you shortly. We'll join you shortly and I give you glad tidings of Jannah. And then he turns to Abu Huraira and the companions that are with him and he says something. Something that is a beloved statement from our messenger. He said, one of the things that I'm going to miss the most from this life is that I won't get to meet my brothers. He said, I won't get to meet my brothers and I'm going to miss that. Abu Huraira was shocked by this statement. Ya Rasulullah, are we not your brothers? Are we not? We're right here. We're with you. What's wrong with you? What's happening? We're here. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, La antum ashab, you are my companions. My brothers and sisters will come later on in time. And they will believe in me like you believe in me, but they will have never had the chance to meet me. I just wish I could have met them. He was speaking about us. This is why the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet bil mu'mineen, Ra'uf rahim to the, to the believers, he is Ra'uf rahim And Abu Huraira asked him, O Messenger of Allah, Will you ever get to meet them? Will you ever be able to meet them the way you want to meet them? And he said, yes, I'll meet them. I'll meet them when I'm standing by Al-Kawthar, by the Hawd. On the day of Qiyamah, I'll meet them. 
I'll call them one by one. I'll call each and every one of them by their name. And I will give them to drink from my fountain with my own hand. He said, I will know them and I will call them one by one. I will give them to drink of the water that will never make them be able to be thirsty again from my own hand. It's hard to grasp the love of this man for his ummah, for his people. On the way back from Baqi, he made another very long dua because he started to feel very ill. And at the end of it, he said, Oh Allah, ummati, ummati. Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. And Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and said, Allah wants to know, even though he's well aware, what makes you cry? He said, ummati, ummati, I'm worried about my ummah after me. I'm afraid for them. How much he worried about us. He said, I'm worried about them, the difficulties they're going to face, and I'm not going to be there to help them. And then Allah told Jibreel alayhi salam, tell my messenger, tell the best of my creation that I will make him happy with his ummah. I will make him pleased with his ummah and I will not grieve him over them. Allahu Akbar. He promised his messenger, I will not grieve you over them. I will make you pleased with them. And he went to the house of Aisha radiallahu anha wa radaha. Then he asked, had the people prayed? And I'm making a very long story short because he couldn't get up. After the salah, our prophet, very weak, barely, barely able to speak, he delivered another long sermon. But then listen to what he said. The first thing he said was, if I've ever harmed any of you, this is the best of Allah's creation, saying if I've ever harmed any of you, and if I owe anything to any one of you, if any one of you thinks that I owe him something or have done him some wrong, then take your rights back from me now. One man said, you owe me a few dinar, and the Prophet said, give it to him. Another man stood up and said, Oh Messenger of Allah, one day you slapped me in the stomach. When the Prophet والسلام, was straightening the rose for salah, he tapped the man in the stomach, his stomach was too far out. So he tapped his stomach lightly. But the man is saying, you smack my stomach, I want my right. So the Prophet والسلام, lifted up his shirt and said, take your right from me. And the man came forward and kissed his blessed stomach. He said, he said, I only said that so I could kiss you. And then the Prophet والسلام, said, a man has been given a choice between staying in this world or going to be with Allah. And he has chosen to go be with Allah. And Abu Bakr cried out with tears in his eyes, may our mothers and fathers be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. Every single prophet was given one dua that Allah guaranteed that he shall answer. Subhanallah, what was that dua that he could have made? Look at how many desires he might have had. He loved his uncle Abu Talib. He, he could have said, Oh Allah, please cause my uncle to embrace Islam. He loved his wife Khadija who passed away at a younger age. If he wanted to, he could have raised his hands and said, Oh Allah, allow my wife to be with me until I pass away. He could have made that dua for any personal need. How many times throughout his life he was faced with a challenge and he could have used that dua. But what did he say? He said, I took that dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave and I kept it with me and I'm going to keep it with me until the day of judgment and I will use it. What did he say? For my ummah, he said. I will use it for my ummah. He sacrificed that dua for every single personal need of his that he could have possibly had. And he said, I'm going to use it for my ummah. Anybody who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, that they will come on the day of judgment and I will make dua to Allah that they enter Jannah. So every single ummati of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's ummah, that person who had an ounce of iman, that person shall eventually enter Jannah. Why? Because our Nabi, our Rasul, the Habib and Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he kept that one dua, that one wish. Every Nabi used his dua in this dunya. Every Rasul took that dua and utilized it for some need. One Nabi, one Rasul stood up and he said, I will save this and I will use it on the day of judgment, not for a personal need, not for my uncle or for my wife or for my this and that. No, I will save it for those who believe in me. So when he sacrificed that one dua for all of us, the least that we can do is we love him more than we love ourselves and we love him more than we love any possession and any belongings. How can any person not love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? His life has been documented in detail by both Muslims and non-Muslims. Those who love him 
and those that resisted him, still they documented in detail. And there's no human being's life that has been documented in detail, personal and private, an open book for the world to see, to be examined like the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To the non-Muslims, I say to you, go home and read about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tonight, if you dare, if you're not afraid of change. Because if you read about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with an open heart and an open mind, there's a chance that love for this man and respect for this man will come into your life, come into your heart, come into your mind, come into your family and your home, and you also may want to be a follower of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you should choose to do so, you will never elevate his name. You will never increase any blessings to his ummah, but you will benefit your own selves. The importance of learning the history of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what does it do and what will it do to me if I study the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Point number one, it increases my love for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at the same time, it increases my love for his maker who has made me as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes you will find Allah admonished him. Not because he said something from his pocket. But because Allah inspired him to say something for us to learn later on, that if you were to make an error or if you were to say something that required admonition, how should you react to that admonition? A lot of us feel bad when we are told. We will go through the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and see how he, the perfect, reacted when he was corrected and when he was told, may Allah make us from those who follow. Can I know? How important it is or can I know what to do in order to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's message if I don't even know how he reacted. So this is the beauty of studying the seerah. It draws you closer to Allah. Our love for him will increase. And at the same time, our love for his companions will increase because they were ready to give up their lives for the sake of Allah. In fact, many of them gave their lives up for the sake of Allah. By learning the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will become regular with our duties unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we will see how they achieved success through following the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us in every single way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has made mention the various details of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every detail, the names, the places, his childhood, his adulthood, and so on. Today we have superheroes, and to mention some of them, that the football stars, we know them. Our children know them. They know who are their girlfriends, astaghfirullah. They know the whole history of the golfer, that one of the top golfers in the world, what happened to him, what were the names of the women in his life, and what exactly he did and they did. They know everyone, and they know so much of them. They know their team, they wear the t-shirts of the team even if it has a devil drawn on it. They don't mind. Am I right? These are Muslim children because they are following. They will cut their hair like baboons in order to look like someone who is just able to kick a ball in the globe, on the globe. Allahu Akbar. But when you ask them about the names of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very rarely will they give them to you. May they be motivated to sit and to listen to the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says indeed, in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a perfect example for those who are looking forward to the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are looking forward to the last day. How many of us are looking forward to meeting with Allah? If you want, here follow the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a husband, as a father, as a person who was a leader, as a man at times of war, they say he was just at times of war. And he was very merciful even at the same time, the time of war. Look at what happened when he entered Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. And he had a vast army. The people of Makkah were now shocked. They looked at the numbers and he says, Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh, O people of Quraysh. And they were at his disposal. He could have done anything. 
Oh you who killed a lot of my companions and relatives what do you think I'm going to do to you today They were silent some of them answered well we hope goodness because you are a good man a son of a good man suddenly you know people are good why because now we are at their mercy Then he says you guys can carry on you people can carry on you are free no retribution today I will tell you what the prophet Yusuf Joseph may peace be upon him told his brothers I am holding nothing against you today no retribution nothing carry on how many of us can do that to our own brothers and sisters and family members I think we as Muslims find it difficult so many of his companions memorized the Quran how did he achieve that most of them were adults today our children are memorizing the Quran mashallah we got to beat the daylights out of them in order for them to know what is next and so on. A lot of the times, this is what people think Hifd is all about. You find the Shaykh sitting, the Imam sitting with one big stick. Where was the stick of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And yet his students, most of them were adults. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, what was their age? They were adults. So adult literacy, although they were unlettered. Allahu Akbar. Look at the love with Nabi sallallahu with which Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught his own people. Then we have also through the seerah and through the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we come to learn the beauty of the Quran, the reasons of revelation, because as you know, the Quran was revealed separately. It did not come down just in book form. 23 years over which the Quran was revealed. As the incidents occurred, verses came down. As the incidents occurred, the verses came down. And this is why it's important to know these stories so you would know why the verse came down. When you know why the verse came down, as you are reciting it, you will actually smile because now you know names and you know places and you know why a verse is there. And you also know that this verse is a lesson for me today in my life. Then, very important matter. How was he with his enemies? He had from amongst his own people who claimed to be his own people, those who were not Muslim, but they were just pretending. Pretending a man like Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He was known as Rasul Munafiqeen, the head of the hypocrites. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam dealt with him in a very, very professional way. He put him in one corner. The man couldn't move this way, he couldn't move that way. Allahu Akbar. Look, even the politicians have a page to take from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How did he deal with his people? Imagine. A man unlettered in the middle of a desert, in the midst of people who could not read or write. It is Allah who sent amongst the unlettered a messenger from them. That means they were unlettered. And he sent a messenger, one of them. The bulk of them were unlettered. It was a big deal to be able to read and write at that time. And Allah says, He sent a messenger from amongst them to them. The point I'm raising is imagine desert, Unlettered, no internet, no phone, no nothing, no means of communication, no fax, no telex. And yet, he changed the globe. In a few years, today, more than 2 billion people follow the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. What powerful man. Imagine what rules and regulations he followed. They came from Allah. Whenever we are in difficulty, pick up the pages of the seerah, the history of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Read what happened to him. You will find that he suffered much more than any one of us could ever suffer. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we take a look, his character, his conduct, his belief, his acts of worship, so much so we will come to learn that Aisha radiallahu anha asked him a question, O Messenger, peace be upon him, you stand in salah at night, until your feet are swollen and yet you have no sin you have been forgiven you are going to be entering paradise so can't you rest a little bit and he says oh aisha afala akuna abdan shakura can i not be should i not be a slave who is thankful to allah i know the rank i know the status i've already got jannah and so on but i want to thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today let's be honest alhamdulillah we do read our salah but sometimes a bit lazily. Have our feet ever swollen that much through salah? Let's be honest. Still we feel lazy. People complain, five minutes too much. That's the test of Allah. If your feet can swell once in your life because of salah, wallahi you have followed the example, the greatest example in existence. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good health and may He make our feet bear the salah that we read because our salah is no comparison to the salah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His love, his purity of the heart, his love for sacrifice. The, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, if you take a look at those companions, 99 of them would give their lives in order to build the life of one of them. I'm sure you know the story of the companions during one of the battles where there was water required. One needed it and he saw his brother had a need. He passed it. And the other one saw his brother had a need. He passed it. And the other one saw his brother had a need. He passed it until they lost their lives in order to save the life of the next man. Today, 99 of us would gather around one man in order to destroy him. That's the opposite. See, totally opposite. Very importantly, we move on to something. The condition of the world at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just before his birth, what was around? Inshallah, we meet, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad, subhanallahi bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.